So today we are going to be talking about serving our children and families, developing West Virginia solutions at a local level. So there's no denying that the cha that there have been many challenges and uh, stresses during this time for all West Virginians. So our lives have been disrupted by COVID-19 pandemic. And during this time, we have, have had many individuals who have been working hard to deliver services to our children, families, and communities. So one bright spot that I have seen um, in the pandemic has been the strong sense of togetherness that West Virginia's have shown. Um, we have truly adapted the, the we are in this together mindset. Um, we are coming together and doing our best to operate quickly and efficiently to meeting the needs of the evolving challenges um, of COVID-19. So many of us are working from home for the first time, kids are home from school, and we're trying to juggle work and family life while maintaining the health and well-being of our families like never before. So that's why I feel like this discussion is very timely and we are very fortunate to have a panel of experts who will be discussing where we go from here and resources available. So with that, I just want to go ahead and introduce our first um, speaker for today's roundtable series, um, Deputy Commissioner for Bureau of Children and Families, Amy Himes. Um, Amy currently oversees the Safe at Home WV program, special projects and IVE unit. Amy has worked in several ro roles in the Bureau of Children and Families. She has previously served as the Community Services Manager in Kanawha and Lincoln County, Child Protective Services Supervisor, a worker, adoption worker, and assisted with the implementation of Centralized Intake and SAMS project. Amy received her bachelor's degree in psychology from West Virginia State College and a master's degree in social work from West Virginia University. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Amy who will be discussing what is being done on the state level for West Virginia children and families during COVID-19. So Amy, I'm gonna go ahead and flip to your, flip to your slide here. All right. And you're, Amy, I think you're muted. <laughs> it's hard to get used to this. <laughs> no worries. Facing the challenge of working from home. This is certainly with the uh, Department of Resources having us today. So I'm going to my next slide. Okay, I have again West Virginia. The Health and Human Resources Commissioner with uh, one of our agencies, the Bureau of Children and Family, five agencies of the Department of Health and Human Resources. So, one portion of our larger. And as you, as but I wanted to touch on this, the role of the Bureau of and Mission is accessible, integrated service system for- Hey, hey Amy, children. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Um, you're not coming in very clear. Can you maybe turn off your video and maybe that will help? Sure. Let's try that. Let's see. There we go. Did that help? Um, um, maybe. maybe. Maybe we'll see you sound better. So you, so we know Sarah and out and get back in. It used to be a problem. So again, I wanted to touch back on our mission, the Bureau for Families, uh, to provide service for all our West children, families, to help them achieve maximum potential and improve their life. We serve both family assistance side and and services sides of hey, Amy, social. I apologize for the interruption again. It's still really hard to hear you. Would there be any way that you could uh, use the dial-in number instead? Um, I just want to make sure everyone can fully hear your presentation. Let me. Would that be in your email? Yes. Okay. If you guys a second, I'll call back. Go ahead and mute this. We're going to talk about something. Getting in there. 
feel free. I'll, I'll mute it. Change. All right. No All right. more. Thank you, Amy. Amy. Um, okay, so would you would you want to wait for her to call in, or do you want to come back? I think we could go to the superintendent, Brittany. Okay. Okay. And then we'll just circle, and then we'll just circle back with Amy here in a second. Then does that yes. work? Yes. Okay. Very I think good. That's perfect. Yes, that would be great. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and do a introduction for our superintendent for today. Um, so Ryan began his term as superintendent of Cabell County Schools in 2017. Um, Mr. Sachs is a true leader in K-12 education with e extensive expertise in curriculum and assessment, uh, media services, tech textbook services, and professional learning services. He started his career in several school level roles, such as principal, assistant principal, director of career and technical education, and as an agriculture education teacher. Before leaving the classroom, he earned the distinction of district teacher of the year, West Virginia State Agriculture Teacher of the Year, and West Virginia State Agriculture Program of the Year. Mr. Sachs strives to provide the best edu educational experience to all children in Cabell County, and we are thrilled that he is able to join us today. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Mr. Sachs. Well, well thank you, Brittany, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today and to share a little bit of what we've been doing in Cabell County um, ever since uh, really March 13th, which was when our, our schools were asked to close and we were really required to pivot very quickly um, into providing um, services to students really focused around two primary areas. And you know that was making sure that their, their needs were being met from um, a social emotional aspect with food service, uh, making sure that they had resources necessary at home. Uh, that was the deployment of uh, support personnel and making sure that we were making contact with students. And then, of course, making sure that we were addressing the academic needs that our students, uh, you know, really, really needed. So um, what I would like to be able to do is to share just a little bit with the group um, the role that our schools in Cabell County have really helped um, with this sudden change and the sudden pivot to um, you know, remote learning or, or virtual learning. And I think that's really kind of interesting. You know, I want to I want to preface that, that there's a difference between virtual learning and remote learning. What, what happened in March was we really had to shift to a remote learning model where um, students were provided, you know, resources um, in order to, you know, keep on track. And it wasn't without its hiccups, but I, I was very, very pleased um, and uh, just overwhelmed with how well our Cabell County School staff responded to this, uh, this, this change. So we offered um, enrichment resources. It was interesting when we would have our food service uh, pickup lines uh, after March 13th, we would have teachers and, and school staff out handing out uh, books and resources so that those children could pick those up. We also did a device deployment at that time so that uh, any of our, our students that did not have a device were able to have a device so that they could participate in those many of those remote learning activities. Um, one of the other things that we did was is that we knew that Wi-Fi and broadband access is a is a limited for many of our children, um, especially some of our children that are living in uh, you know areas where there's higher rates of poverty as well as some of our rural areas. And so one of the things that the school district immediately did was we deployed some of our school buses where we were piloting um, Wi-Fi access on school buses uh, last fall. We were already sort of ahead of the game. And so we were able to deploy 10 school buses across the district and we would locate them in you know key strategic areas and parking lots, church parking lots, so that if a child did not have internet access, they could um, go toward the school bus and with a one within a hundred uh, foot radius of the school bus they would have Wi-Fi access through the school district. We also pointed our, our Wi-Fi uh, routers at our schools out toward the parking lots so that if uh, it was a neighborhood school they could they could walk to the school or their parent could drive to the school to be able to access some of the um, remote learning activities. And then finally our meal sites. We were serving uh, since March 13th, and even over the summer, we've been serving about 10,000 uh, grab-and-go meals, which is a, a, a lunch as well as breakfast for the next day. 
every single day. And that is not an easy feat. Uh, that takes a uh, group of people with a common mission and, and a vision for getting it done um, to, in, order to, to, in order to accomplish that. And so our food service staff, our bus drivers, we had teachers, we had aides that were all stepping up to the plate to be able to pr help prepare those meals and bag those meals and then to distribute those meals at our school sites. Uh, we, um, I, we also uh, created a platform on our school district website called Cabell's Connected Classroom, which sort of provided parents um, access to our learning management system, Schoology, uh, as well as resources for those virtual conversations like Zoom and our team meetings. We made sure uh, that we had a, a practice in place where uh, we would make sure that every single student across Cabell County, and we're the third largest school district in the state of West Virginia, have about 12,000 students. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was a, that every single student was contacted with two-way communication at least once a week. And so that was what our, our school staff was doing. Uh, we would have counselors, social workers, uh, teams of, of, of district staff would actually even do home visits to make sure that the needs of our students were being met and that they had resources um, to ensure that, that they could be successful, uh, whether it be through remote learning or um, just to make sure some of their basic needs are being met with food and, and other items uh, that they may, they may require. For those students that we were not able to get internet access to, uh, we had teachers that created learning packets that they were able to accomplish. Um, again, we were able to deliver those, those meals and other essentials to families without transportation. We, we leveraged uh, our community and school site coordinators. Uh, we have uh, we have four of those across the county, in addition to all of our counselors um, and our attendance workers that we have in the district. They would go to the students' homes and be able to deliver some of those meals if they were not able to get to one of our, I think it was about 45 different feeding sites across Cabell County. So again, this was a huge team effort that everybody was really in alignment to make sure we were meeting the needs of our students at that time and of course over the summer. Uh, you know, as we think about some of the uh, online learning successes that we had, uh, you know, there were speed bumps and hiccups, but one of the things that was really important was for us to be able to uh, engage our students to understand the successes and the challenges, maybe even some of the suggestions that they have. And so I have a group of students that I meet with each year. Um, it's my superintendent student advisory council and it's made up of uh, about 40 students across the district. And in this situation, I called them back and we were meeting weekly um, uh, through our Teams platform and sort of determining you know, what was working and what suggestions did they have. And so they were a huge, huge resource in order to be able to accomplish our mission of providing services to students. Uh, because we had a huge shift in how instruction was being delivered. Uh, we had a survey that went out that, to help inform us as to what we could do to also improve. And some of the survey results I wanted to share with you today was that between 60 and 81 percent of our parents were somewhat or completely satisfied with the resources that Cabell County Schools had provided um, during that, those last three months of school. Um, and this included the electronic devices that we provided, some of the internet access that we tried to, to mitigate and to use with our school buses and our, our facilities. Um, as well as the meal delivery system that we had, um, you know, quickly adapted to. 80% uh, of our staff reported that they were satisfied with the materials that we were able to provide. That included uh, device deployment for our staff. Uh, luckily, we had started uh, refreshing all um, of our staff devices back in the fall. So we were really staged well to quickly pivot from the traditional learning model to this remote learning model in March. Um, and of course, since that time, we've taken extra steps to even prepare further, which I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention here in a second. Uh, when you look at parents, they were, you know, they were, uh, for the most part, very pleased with the communication from the school district. But it's also something that based upon our survey results and our conversations with our students, our conversations with our staff and our parents, that we know that we can continually improve. And so we're working and, and making efforts to, to improve in the areas where we can to make sure that everyone is well informed and has the resources that they need um, should remote learning have to continue or that, um, you know, or, or that's an option that maybe they choose as we 
look at how we're going to possibly re-enter the, the schools, um, the school in the fall. We, um, we also had many of our teachers that were really innovative. And, you know, I think back um, to, a, to a quote that I read um, where it said, chaos in the world brings uneasiness, but it also allows for the opportunity for creativity and growth. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that when you think about the chaos that we have, you know, in our world and in our nation and, and really in our community as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has sort of created some logistical issues in our in our own personal world. Um, it's amazing to see how people have transformed um, and really thought outside the box to create innovation. And I think that that's really what we're looking at right now is, is we're looking at a, a prime time to innovate and to transform, um, I think, the future of, of options for, you know, school. Uh, and so we had we had many teachers that really did some really awesome things. Tasha Roberts is a science is an elementary teacher and she had a science YouTube channel. We had video tributes. We had uh, a beautiful art murals that were constructed in front of schools by some of our teachers to inspire students. Uh, we had online counseling services and we even had, you know, live events like neighborhood parades and, um, you know, uh, completer ceremonies for our career and technical education that were drive through. So again, I think out of chaos brought creativity um, and, and really uh, growth for for how we deliver services. And then, of course, we were also able to accomplish our in-person graduation ceremonies by working with Marshall University, um, utilizing social distancing and masks. We were able to provide that uh, culminating, um, you know, tradition for our high school seniors who had worked so hard um, to get to that point. So we were really proud that we were able to accomplish that in, in a safe manner. Uh, thinking about, you know, the some of the highlights of the programs and services we offered, uh, obviously the food service program, like I mentioned early or earlier, has been just tremendous. Um, and I, I can't say enough for our food service staff, our food service director, who is really, you know, again, they were creative. They thought outside the box in order to make sure that we were meeting that charge. We also have the Healthy Grand Families program. While in Capital County, roughly three and a half to four percent of our students um, live with their grandparent based upon uh, legal custody. We know that we have as many as 20% of our population that um, is living with someone other than their parent. And it could be a grandparent, it could be a, a family member, uh, a, a, an uncle um, or, or someone else because of whatever home, home situations that they have. And so making sure that the resources are available for you know, uh, grandparents and other family members that may not have all of the resources to to support the learning of the children that are under their care is something that we've also really tried to tackle. We are also uh, going to be contracting with uh, an individual to become the di school district's chief health officer for the fall um, so that that if, if we, you know, as we see continued health issues in the community or uh, exposure issues that we'll have a, a primary point of contact that can help us make decisions for the health and the well-being of our students and staff, as well as liaison between the school district and our, our Cabell County Health Department, as well as health officials across the state should the need arise. We're also using, utilizing telehealth with our school counselors and our social workers for students and families, uh, as well as frequent um, you know, home wellness visits for at-risk students. We, uh, for some of our schools, you know, as we look to reopen in the fall, one of the things that um, is, you know, highly recommended through CDC guidelines, the Academy of Pediatrics, as well as the state guidance is, is that if a child was to exhibit symptoms that we need to be able to move them to a location in the school where they can sort of be isolated till a parent comes to pick them up. And so not all of our schools are equipped with extra rooms like that. And so for those schools, we are looking at, at um, mobile office uh, trailers that we can convert into our health clinics at those school sites. And so uh, we're, we're employing that as we look to reopening in the fall as well. Um, and then of course, we, we also know that uh, we have to add additional healthcare employees. Over the past year before the pandemic even hit, um, the legislature appropriated more funds so that we could uh, employ more um, social emotional support staff uh, for the school district. So at that point, we were able to go um, to a system where we have a dedicated counselor for every school 
across the county. Um, some schools have as many as six, but our smaller elementary schools sometimes had to share a counselor. We now have a counselor in every single elementary school. We also added additional social workers across the county. We, in Cabell County, we employ uh, around 12 social workers. And then we also hired some additional nurses. The problem is, is that we still um, have a gap because some of our nurses have to split their time between certain schools. And so in order to safely return to school in the fall when the time is right, um, we know that we're going to need to increase the number of, of nurses we have. So uh, we are contracting with Mountain State ESC to be able to have part-time nurses um, in every single school building that did not have a full-time nurse. Uh, in addition, the school district has made significant efforts to move to one-to-one, -to -one, which is one device for every student. And so the Board of Education uh, uh, unanimously approved um, the purchase of these devices about a month and a half ago. So when the school, when school does resume, whether it be for uh, remote or virtual or face-to-face -face instruction, every single student will have a device. Uh, at the high school level, all of our students will have MacBook Airs. And for K through eight, they will have iPads with middle school having iPads with keyboards. And so being able to shift again, if we have to, to remote learning or for those students that are participating in virtual instruction over the course of the next school year, they will have um, a, an updated device to be able to, to complete their, their assignments and communicate with their teachers. Or again, utilizing those telehealth and counselors and social worker uh, resources. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and um, I'll turn it back over to Mrs. Bruce or uh, to Dr. Lenz. All right, thank, thank you, Ryan, for that informative update on how our children and students are being taken care of during COVID-19 and really beyond COVID. Um, so I kind of want to see if we've gotten uh, Amy Himes back on the line first. Um, Amy, are you back with us? Let me pull that back up. <laughs> Amy, if you're on the phone, Sarah, isn't it star seven to unmute? Yeah, it's star six to unmute. It's okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yes, I am back. Perfect. Okay. All right, well, the floor is yours, Amy. Thank you so much. And, and again, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. As uh, Brittany said earlier, Amy Himes, Deputy Commissioner with the Bureau for Children and Families. I am trying to take control, sorry. And there it goes. Uh, with the Department of Health and Human Resources, Bureau for Children and Families, the um, Again, to refresh, the mission of Bureau for Children and Families is to provide an accessible, integrated, quality, comprehensive quality service system for West Virginia's children, families, and adults to help them achieve maximum potential and improve their life, their quality of life. We work in uh, uh, vast areas of social welfare, uh, supporting in family assistance with families that need it. Um, in in the way of um, SNAP benefits, TANF benefits, on our family assistance side. We also serve in the adult and uh, children's services area to assist families, uh, again, in the area of child protective services, youth services, and adult services. We, have, we provide services across the state uh, in, to every county to families and children in need. Well, that's a very short brief. We are time, time limited. So we have a wealth of information on the wvdhhr.gov site for anybody who wants to see in more detail what our bureau and other bureaus of the DHHR provide. I'm going to give you a um, touch on some highlights of what the Bureau for Children and Families and the initiative and, and things we've worked on during COVID. Uh, again, we, we've really worked to quickly turn around and have some 
programmatic responses in all of our major areas to best serve our families and children in West Virginia during this pandemic. So I want to highlight on a few of those. And these, again, are some high state level. We've also had um, individual and unique um, challenges in our different districts that we've worked to respond to. But again, it's so vast. Um, I, I want to hit on the high levels that have touched probably all of our communities and, and everyone, everyone on the line, someone you know or someone in your area. So to start, in our family assistance programs in the area of SNAP, we applied and worked with the federal government for some waivers to um, minimize the effects of of the food insecurity during pandemic. And we were approved for waivers that um, extended benefits for those who were already receiving SNAP benefits to extend them for six months. There, we also um, worked for a, a supplemental and were granted a supplemental SNAP benefit that was released to existing households. Again, both of these were work in the area to support the, the concern, concerns for food insecurity during this time and hopefully to alleviate some of that stress and anxiety for families who um, may have faced some um, reduction in work hours or, or loss of work. Uh, we've also, during the pandemic, um, continued to accept and approve applications. Our staff, our district offices have remained open with skeleton crews if, if there has been an outbreak or an effect in those areas and, and the offices can't be open. There have been alternatives to utilizing our um, customer services hotline for application and assistance. Our staff have all converted quite successfully, I'd like to add, to teleworking and we virtually, while we ran into kinks and had to work through logistics and technology, we successfully continue to serve um, in an extended uh, teleworking situation in many of our areas. In our areas where it requires um, direct contact, we've worked through these waivers to minimize the need for people to report to offices in a uh, person, we've been handling much of this business over the phone, again, in the area of SNAP and TANF. We've also partnered with and um, um, with the um, Department of Education to um, assist and provide pandemic EBT benefits to all the children who normally are eligible in the counties for free or reduced lunch. So any... Um, Again, any child that was that goes to school in the school age in a county that re that was receiving free or and reduced lunches, breakfast and lunches were issued a um, a EBT card in June to assist the families who now have their children at home. We're really excited about that. That that was a benefit that went out to every child that was registered in those counties, regardless of income. So it was a boost and a help for many families that don't normally receive EBT benefits. Uh, I believe that was at about $300 per child to, to help and assist. Um, I, we also worked on, uh, again, ways to continue benefits through a telephonic signature because signatures were required and those, those waivers um, were granted. We also extended and, and um, were granted permission to allow online purchasing with EBT cards through Walmart and Amazon, which again, is very helpful for families that didn't want to get out and shop during this time, that they could utilize their benefits online and have their um, their things delivered to them or they can do pickups. TANF, um, in the area of TANF, which is our um, temporary assistance for needy families, those benefits, um, they did re also receive an additional pandemic payment to assist. So a, a supplemental increase 
um, of over, it was at $500 uh, for TANF customers. We also uh, had a, uh, in the area of, so that's TANF and, and I'm sorry, I'm working between two documents. With, with the early care and education, again, child care, critical child care needs were an issue during this time, and they worked to, um, to provide a emergency child care program for essential workers uh, that were deemed essential by Homeland Security per the government stay order. Uh, it, it helped in being able to license and support the staff for, um, for temporary providers to um, serve as child care providers because our current infrastructure of, of child care centers were not enough to assist and, and take all of these um, children into child care. Those, are those have been approved and allowed to continue as long as we are under, a, um, under this pandemic and the governor's stay-at-home orders. Um, so we've continued to work to improve child care and, and support of child care. We um, have also received funding as a result of the CARES Act. And it's, uh, used, it's being used to pay for um, that child care need uh, and offered grants uh, for child care to keep their businesses open and to assist them uh, when, when the crisis subsides so we don't lose child care providers. In the area of adult, in the area of child and adult services, uh, We've continued to serve and, and contact um, and work with our kinship relative homes to make contact and set up um, contingency plans in case uh, families would end up with COVID, uh, developing a, a, a plan for care for the children they have in their care. We've uh, worked to survey these families, uh, both uh, kinship relative and foster care families on on how to assist them should there be um, and again we've been fortunate many of these plans that were developed we haven't had to initiate yet but we are working to to have plans to assist the families and the foster care families should we see an increase and in rise in um, positive COVID cases we also provided additional um, assistance for the kinship relative providers um, for the children during COVID to help um, for need of child care. They've also received also most um, of the kinship relative providers also received additional um, payment through TANF as, as I spoke of before in TANF. So that helped assist with the care of the children in care. Uh, we continue to work in the area of children and adult protective services to ensure safety. We have staff that are still responding and continuing investigations on reports of abuse and neglect. So our staff really have never worked while or never stopped working or, or um, many of them we have converted to teleworking uh, and working from their homes, but continue to provide the multitude of services that BCF provides to children and adults in these in these situations. Well, we've also uh, worked on a protocol regarding COVID in the area of homelessness. Um, we've worked with um, all of our residential and child placing agencies to provide guidance during this COVID response or COVID time on responses and assistance should we have issues of outbreaks. Uh, our worked with all of our provider and stakeholder partners for to give guidance and support during COVID because it's been a challenging time for all. We 
again, because of the stay at home orders and some of the directions that came from the governor and above, we've had to work through uh, issues in areas of visitations with our children in care and their, their families. They were temporarily uh, suspended. We've worked to lift that suspension and return to visitations with parents and working with the providers who, who monitor and supervise those. Uh, but we do have protocols in place to um, protect and do this in a socially distancing, safe manner, safe areas. And in addition to that, in our areas, these, these are just all areas we have worked to develop support to our families and our children that we serve. We've also worked to put in place the ability for our for flexibility around our staff as well, which statewide is around 5,500 people. So it truly has affected many people in your communities, the ability for them to be able to work from home. We've uh, allowed some flexibility in scheduling. So if they should have children that they have to care for, their, their hours of work have been able to be adjusted when necessary. Just many of the same things that all businesses are working through, we try to work through that as well to support our um, employees. Uh, and that's, and again, that's a high level touch on many of the things that we've done. I, I want to also leave you with this website because the department has a specific area on our website. It's the www coronavirus.gov.gov, so it's www.coronavirus.gov.gov. You can find a huge amount of information related to what's been happening and what's available. Um, and with that, Brittany, I'll turn it back over to you all. Um, I could talk for days, but I know we're on limited time and I'd like to pass it to someone else. So thank you very much for the opportunity and let me know if there's anything more I can provide. And here's my contact information. All right. Great. Th thanks so much, Amy. We really appreciate that state update. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next um, speaker, um, Dr. Mary Mariana Lenz. Um, she is a professor and chair um, of the Department of Psychology at Marshall University. Um, she holds her master's degree in clinical psychology from Marshall University and a doctorate in de developmental psychology from University of North Carolina at Chapman Hill. Her research and expertise include general topics in child development, as well as impacts of substance use on children and families in Appalachia, the impact of in utero substance exposure on later development, and family systems focused evidence based practices in low resource environments. Dr. Lenz is a true community service leader, um, helping to organize a group of individuals to assist with outreach to our vulnerable population in both Cowboy and Wayne counties who are being impacted by COVID-19. The Huntington Community Care Plan team has created care packages for our youth, worked with our schools, helped with fundraising, and provided food for many West Virginia children and families. Families. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and talk, toss it over to Dr. Lenz. Oh, thanks so much, Brittany. I appreciate it. Um, and I'll just make a few comments because as, as I'm listening to uh, Mr. Sachs and Ms. Himes talk about all the wonderful things that have been done, um, I mean, I would say that's the thing that has amazed me most through all of this is how our communities all across the state have stepped up to really support each other and to reduce the negative impacts of the pandemic on uh, on our kids and families. So just really quickly, um, when all this sort of began to hit and come down, the Department of Psychology already had, we had an outreach office, which is ably staffed by one of our wonderful graduate students, um, Casey Kessler. Um, so we had the outreach office in place and we just started kicking around ideas and we began to put emails out to different listservs and different people we knew. And before long, we had a Facebook page that we were calling the Huntington Area uh, COVID Community Care Plan um, and really just sort of getting it out there um, to people who really wanted to play a role in supporting one another during the pandemic and helping particularly support kids and families. Um, and so 
over the course of time, we were able to put together activity kits um, for kids. We were really focused on kids and families um, that were being served by the mission, who were out of their homes, um, and now were not able to access the school buildings. All those schools were wonderful in reaching out to those families and providing them with support, and we, we wanted to help do that. So we started putting together activity kits that included science activities and literacy activities, and the school gave us some wonderful um, guidance on that as to what kinds of activities would be useful. Um, and then Keith Thomas with the uh, Board of Education said, you know, we can help get some of those kids out to other um, students in the county through the feeding sites, um, which by the way, when I would pull up and see those buses being loaded with meals and people, you know, fanning out to, to feed the kids and take care of them, that was truly an amazing sight when we would drop the boxes off. So we began to put together, you know, kits for them uh, as well. Um, one of my favorites was we we wanted to help kids understand sort of what was going on with all the social distancing and mask wearing and need to hand wash. So we did um, uh, sort of a, a COVID explanation uh, activity kit, and we had kids create their own superhero, which was actually them that could defeat the evil corona um, by washing hands and maintaining distances. We gave them a uh, a dowel rod to decorate so that they would understand what does six feet really mean, um, and how far do I need to go, uh, to to be from someone. Um, and um, like I said, the, the city mission, the schools and so forth were wonderful in helping us get those um, to the kids. And as we kind of progressed, I had a whole group of wonderful students here on campus, graduates and undergraduates and lots of departments and faculty um, who began developing other ideas like um, we had one where we we wanted to blanket the city mission with desserts so that when they were handing out food, they could give folks something sweet uh, to go with it. And so I put it up on the Facebook page and miraculously the 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 uh, citizens in our community and the families reached out and brownies and cookies would show up uh, at the city mission. So it was really quite wonderful. And and that was one of the things that I realized in terms of of how things were unfolding and how these kinds of activities really benefited kids and families. Um, for example, another thing that we did, there are some outreach programs that that um, take food out to people that are in various locations around in our county. And so we we invented the idea of the we called it the PB and J Brigade peanut butter and jelly, you know, make a bunch of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and we drop them off to outreach programs um, through the city mission, through Harmony House. Uh, and a number of others, and uh, our own Sarah Payne and, and her daughter um, put together a huge amount of these peanut butter and jelly snack bags, and um, her daughter did this wonderful artwork on them that was beautiful. And I have to share, when I dropped them off that day um, over at uh, Harmony House, there were still a few people left. It was toward the end of the day. So I handed a few out, and they were so just they thought it was just the sweetest thing in the world that that a family took the time to do that and to decorate them and to to make the drawings and they were showing each other the bags and it was just it, it's really a wonderful thing so if if you're interested the page is still active we've shifted a little bit we're now the huntington as as Brittany was saying we're the huntington community care plan team um it's open to anybody just like our facebook page and and post things that that you would like to do projects that you're involved in um you know get involved in some of the projects um we're just trying to help people get connected with the kinds of outreach that's going on out there and um so just to maybe maybe leave with a couple of comments about um kids and families i've done um several discussions both online and on the phone with people and in various places where they're concerned about the mental health and well-being of kids and families through this um so if I can just leave a couple of pieces of advice that I've kind of learned through this whole outreach effort, um, which also included reaching out to agencies that are providing residential care to kids and delivering huge kits of arts and crafts supplies and, and evening activities. But what we need to remember about kids is they are learning all the time. Every experience, every event that occurs in their world um, as they're growing up is new and different and needs a context and they need to understand it. And the pandemic is one of those things. And the main thing that they need to understand is that 
the things that are happening around them are happening so that people will continue to be safe. Um, they need, I call it the three C's, they need consistency, they need to learn about cooperation, and they need contact. So even though we can't reach out and hug everybody, we can, when we take a walk around our neighborhood, take a piece of sidewalk chalk and leave a note in front of our neighbor's house that says, hey, thinking about you in a big smiley face. So that they begin to understand that, yes, this is different, but yes, we can handle it. And yes, we will get through it. And the things that we're doing are not just to protect us, but they're to take care of our community so that they understand that we're all connected and that we're all taking care of each other. So finding those creative ways to sort of help kids connect with their community and understand how they can have an impact. When kids know that I'm not just sitting here and things are happening to me, I'm involved and I'm making good things happen. Um, they really do very well in these kind of situations when they understand. And when we have kids and families that are in highly stressful situations, and we do, um, whether it's families that are wrestling with um, substance use disorder and are on their way and trying to maintain healthy recoveries, or if we have families that are struggling financially, COVID hit families so very hard uh, financially in terms of their ability to access um, materials and resources and the state has been wonderful in just shifting resources and helping to get them to families where they need them but when we have families that are struggling that we help them understand where the resources are and we support them as much as we possibly can uh, in in adjusting to the situation um, so just to close because uh, again as we said i could go on and on um, but I think I've been so impressed with the way our community here in Cabell County and also across the whole state has really mobilized resources to assist kids and families. Um, uh, my next colleague, Susie Brodoff, is with another agency, River Valley, that has done quite a bit for families. And I think what we can do is help kids see um, what's being done and how that collaboration and cooperation um, is happening to help us get through this and to take care of each other. And um, whatever the school system decides needs to be done um, to help children stay safe and the community stay well and also to keep their educational progress on, tack, uh, or on track, um, I think we need to support that and help kids understand that it may be different, but we're still going to learn and we're still going to get through. So I will turn it back over to uh, Brittany Bruce so that we can move forward. Thank, thanks so much, Dr. Lenz. We really appreciate everything that you're doing to help children and families um, in Cabell County. So we appreciate you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, as uh, Dr. Lenz had mentioned, um, Susie Brodoff. She is the Executive Director of River Valley Child Development Services. And Susie helps to provide high quality early childhood education services to our children, families, and communities throughout West Virginia by facilitating and administering several resources and programs such as RV Cares, School Age Connections, West Virginia Early Childhood Training Connections and Resources, uh, Child Care uh, Resource and Referral, West Virginia Birth to Three, and the Family Child Care Food Program. Susie is a, is a trailblazer in the field of early education and continues to fill the gaps in West Virginia communities to benefit our young children. So Susie, I'm gonna go ahead and toss it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Brittany. And um, it's so exciting to be part of this because our agency is connected to every one of the speakers that we have heard so far. And it just shows how West Virginia is something that we always, hear bad things about West Virginia, but I think we do a really good job of collaborating, especially for our children and families. So I'm very proud of those connections and very proud of our agency. River Valley Child Development Services has been around for 49 years and actually started out um, as a pilot for kindergarten in West Virginia. It was started originally by Dr. Norma Gray, who was a pioneer any in anything related to early childhood and i'm honored to have followed her uh, footsteps and helped build our agency to where we are today um as Brittany said we we do have a variety of programs that um we uh, administer and they cover the whole state 
Um, our main office is in Huntington, but we have programs that are around the state. We work very closely with Amy in her um, role as Bureau of Children and Families, though we have never met. Everything she talked about practically is something that we work in some way with them, and we're very grateful to be a part of that great system. Um, the things that I want to talk about a little bit, she mentioned some about the child care aspect of what has been going on through um, this pandemic. And child care is one of those programs that is truly essential and that had to continue because um, people had to go to work, even though many of us have been able to work virtually. When you think about the back of our community, the medical people, the um, uh, grocery stores, drug stores, all those people, they needed child care. And so the state of West Virginia was very quick to realize that we needed to help the child care um, programs to be able to still function. Though many of them have chosen to stay closed for a while, it is a very challenging thing to say the least to try to run a child care program in, during a pandemic. It is virtually impossible to have a six foot distance uh, when you're caring for babies and young children. So um, trying to um, make all this work and do it safely and be good for children and families has been quite a challenge. And our agency has been a part of that in many different ways. We provide statewide training that is done by our nurse health consultants, and we've actually had a series of um, trainings that has been offered now for the third time. It's uh, like six different sessions, and they've been very well attended by the people in the child care community because they are so desperate to make sure they're doing everything they possibly can to make sure that they're um, providing a safe environment. And um, it's very hard to be wearing masks and um, any kind of covering gar garments when you're working with children, young children without frightening them or trying to um, cause more problems for them. Because um, as Dr. Lynn said, that connection and consistency and contact, that was very well said, that's what children need, especially during this time. So. Um, we've tried to make sure that we're teaching all the healthy um, ways of, of handling all that. So we have been providing those trainings. Um, we have birth to three programs in 12 counties in West Virginia, and those services have continued even during this time. Um, we've gotten our referrals, and rather than going into the homes, which is how we generally handle our um, intakes and getting to know the families and what their needs are, we've been doing it virtually, and um, the families appreciate that. They don't want us coming into their home any more than our staff wants to go into their home at this time, but we're still able to connect with them and find out what their needs are and help them get connected with the next step as far as services. If their child is in need of speech therapy or physical therapy, any of those kinds of services, we still can help them make those connections, which is really, really important. Um, because especially in those babies that are from birth to three, um, any time that is wasted not being able to help them um, is lost time that you can't get back. So we really wanted to make sure that continued um, we also are responsible for the food program in eight counties in the Huntington area. And ordinarily, our um, food program monitor goes into those family homes to make sure that all the food that is being served is a healthy food that they have agreed to serve. Um, of course, at this time, she's not able to go into those homes, but she is virtually monitoring, making sure that they're meeting the needs of the children that are in their care and also giving them guidance because the family providers are, of course, are also, <coughs> excuse me, risking their health, um, still caring for these babies in their homes during this time. <coughs> excuse me, I'm not sick, I promise. But um, they, they want to make sure that um, they're caring for those children safely also. So she gives them extra advice during this time, even though she can't come into their home. <coughs> um, 
So most of our programs we and oh also in through our resource and referrals we have we cover 20 counties that's link connect and choices. And one of the big things that we have been able to do right now is to help families that are considered essential uh, employees be able to get help paying for their child care. And that is just one less burden that families have to deal with. And so the resource and referrals have really stepped up and um, adapted to the changes in the system to take on all these new um, clients. And that has been a huge help for everybody concerned. But the one program I do want to mention that is unique, as far as we know, unique around the country and even maybe internationally because we've had international interest in it, is called RV Cures. And um, it is a center that um, was established a year ago now. And it is for babies that have been affected by substance use disorder. And we keep the enrollment at a small number intentionally. So we are able to give those babies um, very close attention. Um, um, but during this time, we did close for um, two months um, to make sure that we had everything we needed to be able to offer them a safe setting because these ba these babies are more vulnerable that, than most. And so we wanted to make sure that we had everything in place for this. Um, to be able to do that, um, which is one of the things other child care centers are struggling with also, the amount of cleaning the, as far as the time that it takes to clean and the amount of money that has to be spent on the cleaning supplies is unbelievable. I mean, truly, truly an unbelievable number. And so we have uh, been able to get some small grants to help pay for those additional costs. So we have been able to be, we reopened in June and we've been open now for one month. And um, we have been able to provide um, a, the care that is needed for these babies, especially. We are very conscious about um, checking at the door. Nobody enters into the building without having their temperature checked and having the full um, checklist. That includes parent, that includes staff, that includes anybody that needs to come in to deliver a drop of mail, anybody. We are very, very careful about that. And we're constantly monitor monitoring the health of those babies all during the day. Um, the state put in place, um, which I think is a wonderful thing, that nobody can work in a child care center now unless they have had a COVID test and been um, found to be negative. So that needs to happen before the first person can work in a child care center at this time. Um, the state of West Virginia has done an amazing job in helping us have guidance for what we need to do as well as the health department and we're also following the cdc guidelines we want to make sure that whenever this pandemic is officially over all the children in our care are going to still be healthy as well as their families and our staff so um, the extra trainings and um, guidance from um, the bureau of children and families has been invaluable and we are going to continue to make sure that we are providing trainings for all the other people that are in this field of childcare because now more than ever, health and safety really depend on what they do. So um, I'm very grateful to be a part again of a community that cares so much for its young children. And um, thank you very much for asking me to be a part of this. Thanks so much, Susie. We really appreciate you sharing some of the resources that the River Valley Child Development Service uh, Services offers for our children and families. Um, next up um, on our speaker list is um, our uh, Communication and Outreach Director for Mission West Virginia, Kylie Hassan. Um, Kylie is a Huntington native, um, leveraging her passion to help others and her nonprofit experience. Kylie works statewide to recruit foster uh, foster families through statewide community engagement, outreach through various media and networking out outlets, and event planning through West Virginia. Kylie is a graduate of Marshall University and has held various positions with local nonprofits prior to her current role. And we are eager, eager to hear about the resources and services available for foster children and families. So, Kylie. 
thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really grateful to be here and to follow up on all the other amazing panelists that have gone before me. I've learned a lot, um, so I'm happy to be here. Um, like Brittany said, my name is Kylie Hassan, and I'm the Communications Outreach Director for uh, the Frameworks Program at Mission West Virginia. And Mission West Virginia is a nonprofit located in Putnam County that helps to change the lives of youth and families in West Virginia. Uh, we promote positive futures by recruiting foster families, providing life skills education, and creating community connections. Uh, Mission West Virginia has two main programs, our THINK program that stands for Teaching Health Instead of Nagging Kids. They go into uh, middle schools and high schools throughout the state, are in about uh, 20 to 25 counties, and um, teach teens about healthy relationships, um, teen pregnancy prevention, things like that. Um, and the Frameworks program is a program of Mission West Virginia that funds families for children uh, waiting in the foster care system. Um, so we are tasked by DHHR to lead recruitment of foster families in the state, and we serve all 55 counties. Um, so we additionally help these families to navigate the certification process and provide support to kinship caregivers. We're here to assist families as they take the first steps on their foster or adoptive journey. We can answer questions, concerns, provide a foster care and adoption information guide um, that looks like this. So we can we can mail that out or um, send that through an email. Um, it also includes a county specific listing of all the agencies that serve that person's county. Um, and we additionally have a separate guide specifically for relative and kinship caregivers. Um, and um, talk about uh, the need for foster families throughout West Virginia. Um, there continues to be an ongoing need for more foster families um, in all parts of the state. Um, currently, according to the June 2020 legislative foster care placement report, there were 7,093 children currently in the foster care system in West Virginia. Um, so despite COVID hitting the past few months, um, we've received almost 600 inquiries since schools closed on March 13th. Um, we have also um, had the opportunity to, for the governor to place a slide on all of his press, press briefings um, so there is a slide, if you notice when you log on early um, to his press briefings, that um, there's a slide talking about the need for more foster families um, and how you can do that and how you can contact Mission West Virginia. Uh, the private agencies, so um, we're kind of in between, the liaison in between the department and the, the private agencies. There are 11 private agencies that can foster, certify um, foster families throughout the state. And many of those private agencies moved pride training online. Um, and this will continue indefinitely. Um, the, the training must, the people must be interactive with the trainer and families are able to view one another um, even on the online training. Other parts of the home study um, to become a foster parent um, it may be completed online, including interviews and preliminary safety checks. Um, there will always be elements that require in-person and in-home interaction, regardless of the virtual things that we are, are doing. Um, training moving online not only accommodates um, everyone during coronavirus, but it also those families whose work schedules make it very difficult to train in person. So if you are a full time working parent who um, wants to become a foster parent or you're a single parent who struggles with time, um, this going online really helps those families. We have seen families who have inquired previously re-engage now in the process because training is now much more doable for them. So families may, um, you know, have inquired a couple years prior, but training schedules didn't work for them. It wasn't convenient. Um, so now with moving online, um, we have seen an increase in that, which is wonderful. Um, let me get to my next slide here. 
Um, so I wanted to also talk about um, resources that are available for children and their foster families during coronavirus. Um, as Deputy Commissioner Amy Himes touched on earlier, there were extra payments um, that were issued during COVID. Um, one issued payment was in April for non-certified relative kinship families who had children placed in their home by the department. Um, this group was chosen because they are only receiving TANF payments and not full foster care payments. So they were able to give them an additional um, payment issue. A second payment covering the same group of um, families plus certified relative and kinship and all foster parents was issued earlier this month. All families, um, relative and foster families, were given education about who to notify if someone tested positive and uh, to set up contingency plans if something like that were to happen in their home or someone that they were had been exposed to. Um, and finally, we just launched a uh, new page on our website, and I'm going to submit that now into the chat. Um, it is uh, on our website, missionwv.org slash kinship. And um, we teamed up with the department on this. Um, and this website is for relative and kinship providers that um, this website will include resources and important announcements from the West Virginia DHHR. Um, so again, that website is missionwv.org slash kinship. Um, and things that you will find on this page include things like legal resources for those families, financial resources, information for our Kinship Navigator program, and much more. Um, and for time's sake, you can also go to our, um, our website, just missionwb.org, and we've got information on um, foster closets throughout the state and other resources that might those families might find helpful. Um, you can find us on social media. We keep updates um, on our pages of things that are happening, um, important announcements that we receive from other organizations we will share on our page. Um, so if you have something that would, um, that foster families, relative kinship families might find beneficial, um, please feel free to email me and I'd be happy to share um, your partner news on our pages. Um, if you'd like to contact me or if you know of someone that is interested in um, learning more about becoming a foster parent in West Virginia, um, you can um, give us a call at 304-562-0723. Um, this is all of our um, information and um, we'd be happy to help um, anyone. Like I said, we are looking for foster families. Um, of all types to fit the needs of uh, the children that we serve that are also all very different. Um, so if you're a single parent, if you are a full-time working parent, if you are a same-sex couple, we welcome you and we encourage you to apply and we are happy to answer any questions or concerns about fostering or adopting in West Virginia. Um, but I'll turn it back over to you, Brittany. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kylie. We really appreciate you. Sorry, guys, about that feedback. Um, we really appreciate um, the information for um, those acquiring about becoming foster foster families. Um, and we've learned so much today. This has been super informative. Um, I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to Sarah, who's going to take over a couple of questions that we had come through. Sure. Thank you, Brittany. So we have time for two or three questions, and one is um, Superintendent Sachs, when you were talking about meals, uh, and I think you used the number 10,000, is that breakfasts and lunch, or is that a total amount per day, or is it five? Uh, can you can you drill down a little bit on that? Oh, you're on mute. You know, one of these days they'll invent something that uh, just senses that we're speaking and that we're on mute and it just does it for us. I'm sure, I'm sure that may be something that occurs. Um, no, I think it's a great question. So what we're doing is, is we are preparing a breakfast and, I'm sorry, a lunch and a breakfast for the next day when we distribute a meal. So when we, when we say a meal has been served to a child, it's really two meals. So yes, 5,000 lunches, 5,000 breakfasts um, each day. 
that's pretty remarkable. I mean, that's you know, it it really is because um, you know the gravity of being able to bag, uh, you know, uh, you know, five thousand different bags with all of them. And, and I'll tell you this: we're adhering to the meal requirements that the U.S. Department of Agriculture and uh, USDA, you know, that they require. So we're getting all of the required meal components in for that lunch and that breakfast, which you know is another feed in of itself, but. Um, the number of people that are working to make sure this happens every day, it's just remarkable. Yes, uh, I, I can attest because when Dr. Lentz was talking about how my child and I, we did peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, we only did 75 and it was a big task and she's four. It, and but it, it she is. got so much out of that activity. And that's that's what it's all about. It's community and, and, and you know, helping each other. Um, one of the questions that I have, and I, I'm going to open this up for all the, the panelists is, um, what are some good techniques or um, advice, some healthy ways that you, you suggest families to cope with the stress of all of this? Anybody have anything? Um, I'll, I'll kind of throw out maybe a quick suggestion. Um, I think sometimes what, what we want to make sure we're not doing is adding stress that we don't need to add. Um, like expecting ourselves to be perfect, our house to always be clean, stay away from Pinterest for goodness sake, because it only makes you feel bad. Um, <laughs> you know, we got to learn 17 languages and our kids have to be proficient in all these things because we're home. Um, that's just not the reality. So really um, to, uh, to parents, um, you know, grab those little moments um, that you have the time to be with your kids and, and do those fun things. Um, tell stories and, um, and enjoy each other's company. So, so take some of the pressure off um, that way. Uh, it's okay for kids to watch a little bit of TV. It's not going to hurt them. Um, you know, so, so uh, you know, really kind of, uh, kind of give, uh, give everybody a little bit of a break that way. Um, I like to tell the story about my son. We, uh, when we first moved to the farm, we had a lot of power outages. So when the power would go out, we'd take my dad and we'd go out on the porch and we'd light candles and we'd sit around and talk and he'd start telling stories. And one day, um, my son, who Susie knows because she helped, helped raise him, um, but um, he came in and he said, is the power going to go out tonight? And I said, well, no, honey, I don't think so. I think it's fine. And he looked kind of sad. And I said, what's wrong? He said, I wanted to sit out and tell stories. You know, it's like, well, power doesn't have to go out. So don't wait for the power to go out. Do, do the little things. Do the little things and, and take some time. I think that's great advice. Uh, you know, I think the other thing is, is that there there are so many resources that we know um, exist out there to help families right now. Uh, I think sometimes the problem is the families don't know how to access them. And so the advice that I give is, is you know, contact your school district. Um, we have um, the networking resources available to get parents uh, the help that they may need, whether that be, you know, basic necessities or, um, you know, uh, counseling services or, you know, any, any, anything that they may be struggling with, you know, reach out to the school district. We, we can help point them in the right direction. You know, um, one of the, just as we were on this call today, um, I had asked, we, we had, had, I had been made aware of a, a small situation and I said, I would like a wellness check um, on this, this, these, these kids. And so our team immediately, as soon as I made the request because of something I had heard, um, they went out to check on the kids and the kids were, were, were doing well, um, but the parents didn't have food and they didn't have food for the kids. And, um, you know, that's sometimes really hard to hear. Uh, and they, because they hadn't reached out to us, but we had, we had to, you know, sort of go to them to make sure that everything was okay. And, uh, you know, they said that they needed juice. And so we're going to get that for them. But uh, those are the things I think that, you know, weigh on the hearts and the minds of, um, of the people that I work with. This is, and, and I think really from the people that are on this call today is making sure that our, our little ones have those resources so that they can, um, that they can thrive. So. Okay, Susie, did you want to hop in here? Well, I just wanted to say, uh, kind of to add on to what, what Dr. Lynn said is, is that I think because so many people are home now, they're like feeling 
extra guilty. You know, being a parent, you feel guilty anyway because you're a working parent. And so now you're at home and you're supposed to be working, but your child is still there. And trying to balance that is really, I've, I've watched it with my own children trying to ba balance it with their kids. And don't be so hard on yourself. You know, the kids, if, if they do get on their electronics, you know, whatever, you know, it's okay. But when you can try to schedule yourself some free time where you can just sit down and, you know, play game with them or whatever, but don't, don't feel guilty if you can't be with them every minute of the day. I mean, you can't, you can't do both. You can't do your work from home eight hours a day or whatever and homeschool your kids and, you know, be, be the perfect parent or whatever. Just try to give yourself a little break. Try to give yourself a little break. You, you can't be expected to do it all, all full time. You can't. So if they need to get on those electronics or if they need to be on their cell phone or whatever, it, it, it won't kill them. It'll be okay. And then you just give them some time later when you can. And I think that's a perfect segue to our last question that we have time for. And it's about um, what advice would you give employers who are trying to obviously uh, juggle producing products and producing profit, but uh, also have employees that maybe are working from home, juggling child care and responsibilities? Hi, this is Amy, and I'd like to just say with that, to please be as flexible as possible and creative in scheduling. People really will do the job they signed up for if you allow them to and if you work with them. We have a large organization and we are seeing much success and productivity in areas of telework that we never thought we would. So I just urge that that people take the chance you can you know you can always switch gears if it's not working but there people will get the job done they're asked to do and and address all the things they need to at the same time okay anyone else want to hop on that one i yeah i would uh, i just want to say i know with my staff too it was something that we just never allowed before. I mean, no one was ever allowed to work from home, heaven forbid, you know, and then bam, this happened. And now 90% of our staff is working from home. And uh, a lot of what they do, some of them do it at five in the morning or, you know, midnight or whatever. And it's okay with me if that works for them. And again, that gives them their time during the day with their kids. You know, it, I am perfectly fine with whatever hours they can work and still be able to get their work done and still keep themselves healthy and safe. To me, I think we just need to be flexible for that. Okay, well, that did it today. We, wow, this was a very impressive panel. Brittany, thank you for your hard work pulling it together. And we hope that everyone learned um, some things. And uh, please be on the watch out for 40 Top and future programming. And we hope you join us again. Everyone stay safe and well and talk to you soon. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thank you, panelists.